Southwest Airlines because there was too cozy a relationship between the, the manager who was in charge of the inspections of the airplanes on these two, or uh, in the case of Southwest and a similar case in America, different facts, uh, was too friendly. Well, why did they become friendly? Well, you know, you put your 20 years in a government agency, you want to retire, draw a pension, and then go work for somewhere else. Where's the best place to go work for? The agency, the industry you were regulating. Get a job working in the uh, aviation industry for American or Southwest. Are you going to get hired if you were really mean to them while you were working for the regulatory agency? No, you get hired if you were really nice to them. So these three uh, factors all intermesh and help to produce what's called regulatory capture. And I think that at least in the last eight years, and as I say, I think it goes back further, uh, much further actually, uh, there was regulatory capture. Uh, there is an interesting article uh, by, uh, co-authored by uh, one of the co-authors I know, Tom Ferguson, teaches at University of Massachusetts, Boston. But it goes back to 1984, but it was on an incident that occurred in the 1930s in which, <clears throat> according to this paper, the Fed's monetary policy, not its regulatory policy, its monetary policy was influenced by bankers. So um, it's a real phenomenon, and I think you might want to call it stealth deregulation, but I think that's the abuse of the term deregulation. But I do think that that played a big part uh, in uh, what happened. There were all sorts of, well, the most basic duty of a banking regulator, and I know banking the best, the most out of the whole array of financial services, is a requirement to ensure the safety and soundness of the banking industry. That is to make sure that banks do not operate in an unsafe and unsound manner. That's the sort of overarching duty of all ba bank regulatory agencies and arguably, arguably all of the regulators of the financial services industry. Well, if there's one thing that we know that was going on is the financial services industry was operating in an unsafe and unsound manner. So you'd have to say that the regulators failed in their duties, but not because they didn't have the power, they didn't have the will. So here's the fallout so far. And, and I, I'm adding stuff every day. This is a partial list. This is just the big institutions. Bear Stearns was forced to merge with Morgan Chase. Lehman failed. AIG was taken over by the Fed. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were put into conservatorship. WAMU, which was Washington Mutual, one of the largest mortgage lenders in the United States, was taken over by J.P. Morgan Chase. Wachovia was taken over by Wells Fargo after a battle with Citicorp for control of it. And most recently, uh, Pittsburgh National is taking over National City. Now this doesn't count all of the smaller mortgage companies, or well, not so small, countrywide, I, I should put countrywide in it. Countrywide had to sell itself to Bank of America. Countrywide was one of the biggest mortgage lenders. But there were, there were over a hundred smaller mortgage lenders who specialized in subprime mortgages that had failed by the end of 07. I haven't even seen the number. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a transformed industry. Okay. Now, so I'm not saying that there was a failure of regulation, but it wasn't because it was some great deregulation. And I'm not saying that the requirements for affordable housing didn't play into this, but they played into it in a, in a very particular way. And, and this business of lending on subprime mortgages took off uh, because it became profitable. Okay, now, let me skip ahead here because there's a bunch of... Yeah, go ahead. At least uh, Alan Greenspan lowered the interest rates to one percent in order to get George Bush reelected. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, in order to get George. The economy of the election time. Um. Well, let me tell you what he said. His testimony. Did you watch his testimony? 
I did not watch it, but I, uh, I, I, I read the accounts of it. I tried to actually find it on YouTube. I could find a lot of his testimony, but not that one. Okay. It might be on C-SPAN. How did Greenspan answer the question of why he had been so accommodative in his monetary policy? He said he was merely following orders. He testified that he had been complying with the will of Congress. That was quotations. He had done, quote, what I was supposed to do, not what I wanted to do. I make the comment, this is followership, not leadership. Um, first off, I mean, I mean, it's bizarre testimony. Who was he said the will of Congress? I mean, first, I mean, Congress is incapable because of the structure of the Fed tell it, to tell it how to conduct its monetary policy. Um, if he want, if he want, I see your hand. If he wants us to believe he was following orders, it has to be. It's an executive branch operation. It must have been from the White House. So it may have been a Freudian slip, but I don't, I, I don't know. Now, I do know that he was accused of having a monetary policy that was too tight uh, going into 1992 and it cost George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41, his second term and got Bill Clinton elected. And I am told that Greenspan was stung by that criticism. So could it be that consciously or unconsciously he decided that that was never going to happen again? I don't know. I, I, there's no, there's no evidence that there was some sort of direct orders going to keep the interest rates down. Uh, I think the ar better argument is that he was responding to what Wall Street wanted, and I'm going to get into that in a couple of minutes. But there's some, at least one hand up over here. Oh, isn't that the reason it's supposed to be independent? I mean, yes, it's supposed to be no one controlling it. That's right. That was the purpose. That's the, exactly, so that, that, that an administration doesn't use monetary policy for its own purposes. I, am I saying that in the scheme of things there's never pressure put on a Fed? Well, we know historical examples of it, but uh, I know, I, know I, I heard nothing about during the time, this, this time period, and having come out of the Fed, I mean, I follow it, and I have many friends still in the Federal Reserve System, and I never heard any suggestion that there was any pressure uh, on him be doing this. Uh, everybody liked it. When times were good, he got all these adulations. Would you consider these uh, securitized subprime mortgages to be a, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, a new type of financial instrument? An innovative type of financial instrument or to borrow from other parts of the financial world? Securitization has been going on for a long time. Um, and it has an economic purpose. It makes an illiquid asset more liquid. It uh, a, a loan tends to be a very illiquid asset. It's difficult to sell. If it's packaged in a security that is sold with very little markup uh, every day, and it can be sold and resold and transferred between you and me and the third person over here in, in short periods of time. That's what makes that meaning liquidity. Um, I think that the takeoff of securitization in a comparatively short period of time, from 50% of mortgages to 80% of mortgages in a five-year period of time, something dramatic has to be going on for that to occur. Now. I'm going to focus on monetary policy, but there is another story in here that I haven't, and, and some people make a lot about it, and I think I just mentioned it in passing, but I think it's very important. Is something called the Internet, the Basel Standards of Capital Requirements for Banking. They've been going on, they came in in the 80s because I remember writing memos about them around 87, 88, and they treat different assets differently for purposes of having to hold capital against them. And if a bank holds a mortgage on its books, 
It originates the mortgage, 